Welcome to another episode of Hashtag Finance. I'm your host, Grace Pedota with the CSC, and I am joined today by Robin Rabinovich. Did I say it right? You got it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, from Hill and Knowlton. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of uh, the reason that I wanted to kind of chat with you Mm -hmm. um, it's just to kind of get your an understanding of your background in the cannabis sector. I mean, you um, you started uh, pretty young in the space and yeah. uh, grew, <laughs> grew a lot. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, just kind of walk us through your experience in the cannabis sector. For sure. So I originally entered into the space during the MMPR. So originally it was only focused on medical and that was kind of my start. Um, so I started originally as a marketing coordinator for Cantrust, obviously very different from where Cantrust is today, um, but it was a very busy time for us. So that was really where we were seeing crazy patient growth. We went from about 400 patients to 40,000 patients during my time there. We went public as a company as well, but I think really the greatest thing that we learned is just some of those operational steps going from licensing into, you know, full practice, again, solely under medical, um, and then got to really face a lot of new challenges, such as the ACMPR coming into play, working towards our oil license and really participating in, you know, novel categories at that time. Okay. After working at Cantrust, uh, I transitioned over to Terrasen. So it was very early on in Terrasen's life cycle. So I spent a lot of my time working directly with our head of QA, who's amazing, um, on a lot of licensing opportunities. So I originally came in under a BD umbrella, business development, but we really needed a number of these licenses to actually conduct business development activities and partnerships. So a lot of my time was spent on that, working towards our initial sales license and then working at more, you know, I would say restrictive or detailed licenses such as the EU GMP license, which was originally issued from BFAM out of Germany. So that was quite unique, I think, in the journey of Terrace End, but also got to dabble a little bit, just a tiny bit, in some of our U.S. opportunities as well as we kind of took on that new strategy. So really ended up being in charge of four main departments at Terrace End. One was procurement, so really staying in tune to kind of the wholesale market between licensed producers, which really came into place, I think, as people began specializing, focusing less on that vertical integration aspect. Um, my focus was spent on international opportunities, so exporting product into Germany and exploring other markets as well. Um, I was also in charge of white label activities, so it really focuses on that go-to-market aspect of things, and I worked directly with our subsidiary that was called Ascendant Labs, um, who was doing really unique stuff under the genomics category of our industry. So I spent a lot of time across different aspects of the space, which really we thought, you know, was a quite unique perspective now moving into the consulting side of things or the service side of things. That's awesome. And what, yeah. what do you think, from all of your experience, what do you think was your favorite part? So I really love the hands up, hands on opportunities of like just living in a startup, right? So whether it was jumping on, you know, first harvest that the companies were conducting or participating in things like our ramp up for legalization and just trying to get all the stuff on the trucks, be able to participate on day one, those kind of, you know, very unique opportunities. I'm just very thankful for having a chance to kind of participate in them and, and being a part of it. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I saw, I just uh, added you on Instagram and I saw your, uh, your pictures there and I was like, wow, this is really cool. You really um, were in a lot of cool places like grows and stuff, which was, which is sure. awesome. And, and yeah, that's, that's a cool experience that you got at, uh, you know, when the, when the industry was just starting out. For and, sure. I was very, very lucky with my timing. I kind of came yeah. right out of university and jumped right into Cantra. So I got very lucky there. That's amazing. And when you first started um, in the cannabis industry, and 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 now, sorry, you're at you're at Hill and Knowlton, which is mm -hmm. which is uh, sorry. If you could just elaborate on what Hill and Knowlton does. 
For sure. So we're primarily a uh, public relations and government relations focused consulting agency. Uh, we do step outside of that. So we do a lot of corporate communications and we really saw the industry now needing some B2B support. So whether it's people working through that licensing process, which obviously has changed quite a bit since Health Canada made those announcements, but I think there's a lot of focus in strategic work that can go in beyond licensing. So whether it's helping individuals, again, utilize certain partners partnerships just through that specialization of the industry but as well just helping people navigate through the industry and both you know being able to really assess and develop domestic as well as international opportunities so a little bit different than the kind of standard uh, toolkit that Hill and Elton would bring to the table in other industries or other sectors. Yeah, and you probably have some, uh, some killer insight right now uh, as to where the economy is uh, with everything that's going on um, and uh, just when you first started uh, in the industry, so Cannabis 2.0, um, where do you think uh, Cannabis 2.0 is now and where do you think uh, will be, is there a Cannabis 3.0 like after this? Mm -hmm. Are we still going to be developing on, on Cannabis 2.0? Yeah, so I think Cannabis 2.0 covered a, like a lot more flexible in terms of product offerings than what we saw previously, just in the introduction of dried flour and then in the introduction of oil-based products. So I think as we now move into 2.0, uh, we see a ton of product saturation in certain product categories. So whether that's vape pens or chocolate, I think there are certain categories of 2.0 where you're seeing more players, you know, jump in and play a role. But I definitely do think whether it's considered 3.0 or just a progression or innovation of 2.0, I do think there's a lot of opportunity for more unique product offerings to come to market. And I think particularly if we look at something like CBD topicals, I think that has a ton of opportunity. Hill and Knowlton actually conducted a study when we're talking about new consumers entering the market market, not trying to get those from the black market to move over, but we really see CBD as a category, the non-euphoric category, and particularly with product formats that may not require anyone to smoke it as a huge category that might open up new users, kind of increase that pie as opposed to taking a slice of, you know, the pie yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. And is see, like, I keep hearing different things. <laughs> So are you breaking oh, so up just, a tiny uh, bit there? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Got you back, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, is CBD legal? I, I always hear different things from different people. So where are you talking about? In, in Canada here or? Yeah, in Canada. Yeah, so I think there is a clear distinction between hemp-derived oil, okay. right, and then CBD that may come from other products and kind of be governed under the Cannabis Act. But I think that was also a big step in moving towards the Cannabis Act, where really the industrial hemp laws were now kind of ruled in. So there were interactions that were are now allowed between industrial hemp farmers, particularly when we're trying to cultivate flower material, as mm -hmm. opposed to previously where it was just seed and stock material. So CBD is legal, governed under the appropriate platform, but I think there's a lot of confusion when we see hemp derived products being sold at places like Sephora and the Bay as opposed to CBD pr or products that contain CBD that may be sold through traditional measures like the OCS or a retail location or through the medical program. Oh I see. And it gets even more complicated when we dive into Europe and the lovely novel food regulations. Oh yeah, oh I, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so like when you were, when you were first starting out, I mean, you probably like, what did you study for your undergrad? Like you probably weren't expecting to kind of dive into the cannabis industry. Yeah. So in the last year of my, I took an undergrad just in business. So business yeah. commerce with a focus on international business. So it did kind of tie back into it when I dove into more international opportunities at TerraSend. But really, you know, I would say I have my degree and then I have my like cannabis kind of degree just from learning and living it and, and being in it. And I think okay. that's also a huge advantage to being in it early, right? When there were few players and we just needed all hands on deck. So um, although my business training is, you know, in international business, um, I've spent probably more than the average person on the cultivation and the science side when it comes to cannabis. So I'm able to like sprinkle some of that knowledge in there where, but it, I think it really speaks to the great 
you know, group of people that really come together in the cannabis industry and just the great team that I have and, and resources that I've learned from over this time, as opposed Amazing. to, you know, there's probably a lot of uh, self teaching that you had to kind of do. So what, what resources did you use to kind of keep on top of things? It was a fast moving uh, industry and still is. For sure. I think staying on top of the regulatory changes is always something that's like extremely important. I think initially when there were 20 companies in the industry or 20 licenses, it was, it was very easy to stay on top of everything. Like I remember building spreadsheets that was tracking everyone's SKU offering, everyone's price per gram. I mean, to think about doing that in today's age, it's a little bit overwhelming, but I think there are definitely now tools that allow, especially with you know, online resources available that you can really stay in tune with the industry as it develops and change. Um, but in terms of what we really use, we, we kind of went back to pharma, right? So whether it's going back to good production practices that exist in pharmaceutical industries or adhering to the pharmacopoeia, both American and European, there are a ton of practices that you can bring from pharma. And that's why I was really lucky to be with the head of QA that had 15 years experience in bringing pharmaceutical products to market. And then alongside with our lovely CEO, who at that time was also a pharmacist. So I think both companies, Cantrust and Terrasend, were very rooted in, in some of those, um, you know, more medicinally and pharmaceutically focused products and routes to market. So that's, I think, where we pulled a lot of knowledge from and we were able to take, you know, some learning even from the pharmacopias itself. But I know it's getting pretty nerdy into things. So I'll try and- No, I'm, I'm amazed at how much you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. I love yeah. that. You're, you've got, you found your niche and, and you're, you stuck to it. And uh, exactly. that's awesome. Yeah. Now I'm probably like a slightly too passionate about the subject, but uh, we'll, we'll find a common medium in time. <laughs> Uh, and then I hate to, to, to get into the darker side of yeah. things, but I do want to bring up the, uh, how cannabis retail retailers were not, uh, recently were not uh, deemed as an essential workplace. Yeah. And we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, del well, you can only get it through the o OCS. Uh, For sure. Delivery. Um, so what, what, what do you, what does that mean? Like, I mean, I, I know Omar Khan probably like almost to this day a year ago was in talking about the execution of retail stores and now here we are a year later where you know they're doing a non-essential uh, workplace and, yeah um, and now like we see for that for the future of cannabis retailers so as of yesterday um hill and Knowlton was actually working on this we we hosted a lovely uh I think it was over teams because I know we we're having a little bit of technical issues, but we had about 200 participants on the phone kind of talking about this and what this really means for their business and, you know, providing as much, you know, clarity as well as advice along that way. Um, so we pulled together a different group of clients um, and individuals, you know, stakeholders from the industry. And we actually worked with the government to get the emergency issue order that was presented yesterday uh, to allow click and collect. Right. So that will at least allow retailers. And I think the biggest focus of something like this was not only to protect, you know, the businesses of the retailers and the employees that they keep on their books, but I think directly in line with that is to make sure that all of the efforts that have been put behind combating the black market didn't fall right back into place um, if the only access point was really through the OCS, which at that time was kind of forcing people to go to their post office to also pick mm -hmm. up the product, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when we're talking about the goals of shutting it down and that social isolation or social distancing and physical distancing, um, it just had to align directly with, you know, the other side in terms of those access points. But on the Twitter sphere in our lovely cannabis industry, which, you know, fuels a ton of conversation, I saw something that was really interesting. And to make it clear, very much my own opinions on this matter, but we talk about, and we, when we compare about an essential service to alcohol, the addiction rates are very much spoken about on why those need to stay open and the harm versus reward in closing something like that down. Mm -hmm. If you look at one of the lovely Health Canada warning labels that we require to rotate on all of our packaging, it does speak to addiction. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of it was a little bit of a battling conversation between obviously understanding the benefits and the need to 
you know, allow something like retail to exist with social distancing. But I just thought it was an interesting, you know, added kind of conversation that was happening where it was like, if this isn't being considered essential, then we need to review that lovely warning label. So again, it's just kind of some conversation that came up in the Twitter sphere, but I thought it was a very interesting point. When no, I, I, I'm so, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. uh, a friend of mine, she has her master's in social work. Um, and, you know, when this was all starting out, I just thought, okay, well, if everything's shutting down, like, what about, well, like, what about, like, and they're only keeping, like, LCBO and, like, cannabis mm -hmm. um, uh, retailers open, which now is not the case, but LCBO, she was like, it would be, it's very interesting if a reporter went in at the end of this and really um, showed how uh, rampant the addiction to alcohol really runs in Ontario. And, right. And the fact that, you know, if they did shut down um, LCBOs, um, that there would be some sort of mental health uh, problems and they don't want to face that. So I, I, I think people kind of turn a blind eye to, um, to the alcohol abuse that does happen in, in Ontario. And, and I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very tough job, right? I could not imagine sitting in those seats having to make those decisions. And I think, um, I think a lot of people are, are really pleasantly surprised with Ford's actions on this as well, right? Yeah. And kind of being as transparent as he is throughout this process. So uh, by no means would be a seat that I would want to sit in, but being, you know, critical on the other side of things, I think it's just an interesting conversation point more than anything. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and and I, I know that you uh, kind of focus on the technology side of things at Helen Knowlton, like the, the uh, transformative technologies and the new technologies that are coming into market. Um, what kind of technologies do you think, like now we're seeing click and pay? That's yeah. Technology, like what other technologies do you think that are going to be integrated into the cannabis sector after all of this is done? Yeah, so I don't know if it's necessarily COVID specific. I think we're starting to see this trend come forward where a lot of power is put behind data, right? Okay. So there's a lot of new or companies that are existing right now, both in the US and in Canada, that are able to really pull a lot of the data from the point of sale um, and really use those as tools for companies to start making better business issues decisions, whether it's understanding like critical limits to develop the supply chain. But I think that's where initially, if particularly in the first wave of getting products to market, everyone was delivering what they could, right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't this kind of strategic thinking and necessarily how much we should be delivering and when it was very much ad hoc based on what we were able to produce okay. at the time. Dad, Lizia? Sorry, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> no worries, no worries. They don't know where I dropped off, so let me know. <laughs> oh, we, we'll let each other know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I think there are certain technology tools that are going to allow businesses to start being um, more effective and efficient in their supply chain management. Right now, all of the changes that are a result of click and collect um, are only in place for a 14-day period with the ability to extend. So this is kind of an emergency order that was dropped in as opposed to a full regulatory change that will stay in place. But, mm -hmm. you know, with just like ease and convenience and hopefully additional access points brought for individuals, hopefully it's something we'll see today, but I think that's a broader conversation to be had later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've, I've always been curious about this, um, like, as you're saying, like, they, they're collecting data from point of sale. Is that, do you think that um, that will be an issue moving forward on, on privacy from, from, from yeah. buyers or users? So there's certain information that can be really pulled together and all of the personal information can be stripped. And we were also dealing with this early on in the industry when we're talking about medical patient information, yeah. right, yeah. which is yeah. even more kind of scrutinized and the way that you develop your systems and e-commerce channels. That was a huge component that was always really very much a focus in this. So um, obviously privacy concerns. And I think that's something where you still see a little bit stigma towards yeah. the industry where individuals might want to not want to go in and use a credit card or purchase online because of that you know trail back to them as individuals that I do think will you know personal opinions on those matters will ease as the stigma continues to to move away from this industry but um, again you know more on the other side I think privacy will always be a concern uh, on this particular product both on the medical and the adult use side of things.
Definitely. And, and uh, if you're, if you were to give advice to cannabis companies, like in this industry right now, we're seeing a lot of cannabis uh, companies having a, um, a different balance sheet. You know, people are concerned at what the balance sheet looks like. And mm -hmm. do you think that branding will help a lot of these cannabis companies survive? Um, is it imp an important element? And if so, um, what do you think is the major shift in branding for these cannabis companies? What the, should they be looking to do? Yeah, so I think early on, this industry is very opportunistic. Um, we kind of, you know, there were strategic partnerships that could develop from the U.S. and suddenly a company was a gummy company because of the IP that could be pulled down. Um, mm -hmm. I think there will be a reshift in kind of, you know, developing those purpose of the brands itself. So making sure that the purpose and, and how you're actually communicating for that brand aligns with the product offerings that you're making and where you're communicating those brands to. So I don't think it can solely be about building a great brand book. Um, and, you know, having something that appeals to a certain niche in the industry. But I think it's that direct alignment back to the focus of the company, where mm -hmm. their strengths are. Um, and that might not be, you know, in their own operations, but might be utilized through partnerships. But I think it's that connection back. Do the products that you're making speak to the appropriate group? And then are you communicating that in an appropriate channel? Um, and hopefully things like consumption lounges and special occasion permits um, do advance because I just think that would be a very unique opportunity to connect a branding exercise with an actual call to action, which I don't think we get in this space because there's never really that opportunity to communicate hands on and then, you know, kind of push them into a, a position where they can actually make that purchase. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and how far do you think we are from uh, consumption lounges in, uh, in Toronto? <laughs> so I think when a lot of people talk about consumption lounges, they, they really have this like vision in mind, probably of the, you know, vape lounges yeah, back like in the day. And, and exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I think if, if we want that to happen, that's a much harder battle to take on, right? Because yeah. then you're playing against the Smoke Free Ontario Act as well. Um, and then I think if we look at consumption lounges as a possibility of like restaurateurs entering and chefs entering and kind of what the advancement of that part of the consumption lounge could look like, uh, particularly with the focus on edibles, hopefully we'll be able to advance that forward quicker. But I think if we go in with this goal of, you know, these hazy filled rooms that we can all sit down and enjoy a joint together, I think that will be a much tougher battle to take on. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You, you just answered my other question. I was going to ask you, which was, uh, which was, you know, what's what's the first step? And I guess that's uh, that's through edibles tastings, right? That's how we kind of get that going, and then you kind of get that picture out of people's head or that stigma that they have, for right? Challenges. Yeah. For sure. But there's been some great movement in the states with it very impressive branding out there as well in these consumption lounges. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of what that will look like. It's just, will always be, I think, in the plain packaged approach as Canada likes to take on when we, we speak to cannabis. Yeah. And, and speaking of the U.S., what's going on in the U.S.? Is it, uh, are they at a full halt or are we going to, are they going to uh, uh, move forward with legalization? So I think it very much depends who's in power next. Yeah. Um, you know, one of our biggest supporters dropped out yesterday, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's not going to be an initial discussion point. So I don't think it's going to be something personally that's going to happen in the first hundred days of anyone coming into office, yeah. um, particularly with now the pandemic. Um, and I think planning for future pandemics as well being such a priority, I think it'll be very hard to add that high up on the roster in terms of what their initial goals are going to be. So. I think there might be more movement under the banking access provisions of what we deal with in the U.S., particularly under CBD. Um, but I do think that legalization in the midst of everything that's happening now um, will be further out. But that, again, doesn't speak to the lack or doesn't mean there's lack of opportunity in the U.S. I think, you know, how companies are doing it now state by state, a number of them are being very successful and there is yeah. a very strong market out there. It's just that, um, you know, kind of gaining efficiencies through an MSO by actually being able to pull together might happen later yeah. when it's done. Yeah, yeah. reality of today. Uh, but would love to hear your opinion as well. And, you know, I think, you know, the cannabis industry has always had to pivot so quickly 
uh, yeah. that I always feel like they could survive anything. Like <laughs> they've had to go through so much. And it's just, yeah. I remember when we did uh, Cannabis Week la um, last year in May, um, we had, you know, Kim Rivers from True Leave and Steve White. And, you know, they're talking to me about how they had to move so quickly and, mm -hmm. and I'm like amazed at how you can just move your business plan and like direction just through, you know, a law that was changed next oh, week, sure. the week before, right? And they're still always changing. Um, yeah. And after spending some time uh, working in New Jersey on some of the regulations and just the licensing, I've never been more thankful to the Health Canada regulations here mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah. They're very clear and concise. And I know I probably go a little bit deeper than the average person on regulations, but I mean, comparatively, there's a lot of clarity that's actually provided in our regulations versus some of those that are written state by state in the U.S. and just how that all pulls through to a, some sort of standardized testing from a health and quality perspective, right? Because I think that's the most important or biggest risk that we face by having these separate regulatory systems kind of play within each other. Yeah, and you mentioned CBD. So what do you think the, regula the regulations are going to look like for that for topicals because I'm not really seeing a lot um, mm -hmm. but um, do you think they'll be pretty strict or so I think right now um, until we really explore what you know like NHPs or anything looks like right now I think it's still going to be governed under the Cannabis Act and, and through traditional channels I think uh, Apotheca with the partnership with uh, 48 North they just dropped, I think, like the first topical to market right now in Ontario, at least. So um, people are starting to come up with it. Um, there's also been, you know, depending on kind of the technology used to process some of the input materials, not to get too technical, but you're dealing with like the skin barrier at this point in time. So dealing with things like nanotechnology to increase the bioavailability of these products, I think will be important. So I don't know if people are waiting for that level of sophistication to come to their product offerings, um, or if they're just seeing it not as a category that they'd like to participate in. But um, again, back to kind of our original point, I do think that would be a unique product category to see some some new user kind of come into the space, which I think we all want to see. Very cool. Yeah, because it's been, it hasn't, there hasn't really been anything new, right? It's just been very moving yeah. around, shifting as an industry, but that'd be cool to see some topicals, especially for athletes. Like, I think it's, it's a really, um, I mean, like whenever I have um, sore joints from, uh, yeah. I do a lot of biking, I do weight training. The first thing I do, instead of putting on like an A535, because um, it's just too, too strong for me like with the smell yeah. it's just it's too much um I'll put on um like a CBD topical and it it's way better it's just a, a bit more natural yeah for yeah sure. and hopefully on the medical side just in terms of like skin issues as well um yeah. hopefully yeah. there'll be some advancement there because you hear some anecdotal stories about psoriasis or eczema so it'd be interesting to see those categories also advance because I think we just traditionally think about cannabis equaling pain or sleep or yeah. right so it would be a different category to kind of see advance on the medical side which hopefully we'll continue to see advancements on it's amazing how people have such strong opinions uh, in the cannabis industry it's yeah. like all, it's either one way or the other and you're just like okay there's such thing called balance <laughs> yeah there's room for all of us here and everyone's opinions in it but uh it's probably why a lot of them entered the space to beginning right to begin with yeah exactly. so where are you quarantined you're at your your place and are you located in toronto Living in Toronto, this is the lovely office that my boyfriend and I will routinely fight over, depending on who's meeting is a priority. So we got it today. Um, and then uh, he will kind of come in later and take it over for the evening. But very lucky, we were in a very small condo living together with two dogs um, as of a couple months ago. So we just moved into our house and lucky that we're not directly on top of each other during these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember, oh, Barrington says hi, by the way. <laughs> Amazing, I bugged him right when all this went down. He's uh, He's been great. So he yeah. used to come in and pop in at, at Terrasang because he lived around the corner, but uh, yeah. now I'll have to schedule my meetings with him instead. He speaks very highly of you and he wishes you well. Um, yeah. and, um, he was saying, Grace, you know, uh, I had a call with him the other day. He goes, Grace, you're just lucky. That you don't have kids right now <laughs> like just be lucky you don't have kids right now I'm like okay 
<laughs> I saw I saw something go viral where it's like not to brag, but this is a really good time not to have kids. And uh, <laughs> you know, that's been a huge battle for a ton of my colleagues where I'm on the phone with them and they're like, Okay, I have to go do homeschooling for an hour. I'll be right back. And and yeah. I'm sitting there being like, I have to take my dog for a walk. I really shouldn't be complaining, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> some worries. Exactly. Have you picked up any uh hobbies during uh during uh, quarantine? So I feel like this is like the entire cannabis industry who recently got very into making bread. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> Have you been seeing that too? I saw that today and I was like, what? And they were in the cannabis industry. They're like, everyone's making bread. I'm like, everyone oh. is making bread. Probably not the best thing to advertise the first day of Passover, but that's okay because I'm making bread for everyone else. So, um, but it, it's good. Awesome. So took up making bread. And definitely exploring, I just cracked some lovely cannabis seeds. So we'll explore that four plant uh, per household limit here in Ontario. But nice. although I've spent time in cultivation, I wouldn't say I've ever led it. So that will be an experiment of its own. I'm calling all of my friends from the industry being like, okay, can I transfer the seed now? Is it supposed to look like this? So glad to have uh, that skill set on, you know, on dial. So but what about yourself? Any? Um, I am, uh, I'm doing a lot of poetry writing. I was oh, like, wow. Yeah. yeah, so I'm really enjoying that. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, it's been interesting. I think I might, I was kind of studying Italian a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, cause my, my nonna or my, my grandmother speaks yeah. like, Italian. And so it's just like, when are you going to speak Italian to me? And I was like, well, maybe after this whole thing ends. Right. Like, <laughs> Now's the time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but I, I, I do, uh, I do appreciate looking at the brighter side of things. I do appreciate the time to kind of, to have that time to do hobbies, and it's, it's interesting to see like how much time um, you didn't waste, but like how much time was put forth to like networking and being with other people ah. and that you never dedicated to yourself, really. So. For sure. For yeah. sure. And definitely taking that time to get into a little bit more of a routine. I feel like we're all very used to just running um, yeah, at a certain yeah. pace. So whether it's like being in the country or trying to set some sort of standard on physical fitness, which I'm attempting to do, haven't successfully done it yet, but we're, we're all trying our best. Um, yeah. You know, it's crazy to kind of try and get into a little bit more of a routine as opposed to just like running, which has been much of the last five years of our lives here. I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, uh, for talking with me today. It's, uh, thank you. 